It's also a great pleasure to be able to introduce this evening's speaker, Randy Barnett. He's the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Legal Theory at Georgetown University Law Center, where he teaches constitutional law and contracts and redirects the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. After graduating from Northwestern University and Harvard Law School, he tried many felony cases as a prosecutor in the Cook County State's Attorney General's Office in Chicago. After nearly a decade, his half decade as a prosecutor, he began a career teaching law and has been at Georgetown since 2006. He's authored 11 books, along with over more than 100 scholarly articles and reviews, and his latest book is The Original Meaning of the 14th Amendment, His Letter and Spirit. He's also argued cases before the U.S. Supreme Court in 2004, for instance, he argued the medical marijuana case of Gonzalez v. Rich in 2012. He helped to represent the National Federation of Independent Business in its Supreme Court case against the Affordable Care Act. It's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Barnett here at campus. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Professor Ingram, for that introduction. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be at the Ohio University. I know that's... I am a Northwestern alum, as you heard, and I have to tell you one of the great thrills of being a Northwestern football fan is the time we get to defeat the other school. Um, so that's, and I, sure, I have a feeling we share that thrill in common. Um, beating the other school, that is. Anyway, um, I also have to say that I have developed a very soft spot in my heart for the state of Ohio. Why is that, you might ask? I'm actually from the Chicagoland area, south side of Chicago. Um, Ohio really just was the place in between us and the East Coast, if we ever went that way. Uh, but I have, in fact, developed a very soft spot for the state of Ohio because for the last 20 years or so, I've become deeply immersed in what is called constitutional abolitionism or anti-slavery constitutionalism. It could be called either one. And Ohio played a very important role in the development of these anti-slavery constitutionalist arguments, especially somebody who has become a hero of mine, uh, and that is uh, Salmon Chase, Salmon P. Chase. Um, and he's, I don't have that many heroes, because uh, most people, <laughs> they're just too imperfect to be their hero, but this guy comes close to being a hero. And he was um, the first free soil senator um, in 1850 from Ohio. Uh, he was the first Republican governor elected uh, anywhere in the United States in 1856. Um, uh, and then, as you may know, he then became uh, the Treasury Secretary, Secretary of Treasury um, under the, in the Lincoln administration before being appointed to succeed Roger Taney, the infamous Roger Taney, the author of Dred Scott, uh, as Chief Justice of the United States uh, Supreme Court. He also um, uh, presided over the impeachment trial of Andrew Johnson. Uh, but the thing that makes him the most um, uh, significant, in my view, is the nickname he got uh, when he was a young man in Cincinnati, because that's where he practiced law, was in Cincinnati, and he got the nickname the Attorney General for Runaway Slaves uh, for his legal defense of slaves throughout the, throughout the country, throughout the North. Uh, it was a derisive nickname that he was given by his critics, but it was one that he took to heart, um, as, and he took a matter of pride in, and so it was very, very fitting that when Roger Taney, the author of Dred Scott, passed away, uh, Abraham Lincoln would nominate his sort of pain in the side, Sam and Chase, uh, his Treasury Secretary, uh, to be Chief Justice. And so we went from Roger Taney, the author of Dred Scott, to the Attorney General for Runaway Slaves, Sam and Chase, a proud, proud Ohioan. And so for that reason, uh, and because Chase, you know, Chase came out of a culture in Ohio that was a very important anti-slavery culture, um, he's become a hero, and as I say, Ohio has a, um, a, I have a soft spot in my heart for Ohio. If you ever get to Cincinnati, Chase is buried there. You can go to the cemetery there. It's a beautiful grave. Uh, and I encourage you to uh, read up about him uh, and listen uh, 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 and go visit him. But that's not my topic today. That, I could come back and talk about anti-slavery constitutionalism and Sam and Chase on another day. Uh, the topic I'm talking about today for Constitution Day is do we live in a democracy or a republic, and why does that matter? try to stop popping my peas here. In 1787, James Madison had a problem. After living for 10 years under the Articles of Confederation, Madison had worked tires, tirelessly behind the scenes to bring about a convention to devise a new constitution. In September of 1786, he participated in a preliminary convention in Annapolis, Maryland. But then not that many states showed up. 
By 1787, he had secured enough support of key players like George Washington and Ben Franklin to convene a constitutional convention in Philadelphia, which, as you know, turned out a little more, it turned out a little different. But now, having achieved a convention that was going to be held, the pressure was really on the 36-year-old Madison. He was 36 years old. Before journeying to Philadelphia, he crammed for the gathering like a student for his exams from a chest full of books sent to him by his friend and mentor, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was about 10 years older than Madison. He sent him a whole chest full of books from his collection to study up for the convention because the cerebral Madison had a truly fundamental problem to solve. Like many others, he had concluded that the American regime governed by the Articles of Confederation was grossly inadequate and contrary to what the Virginia Declaration of Rights referred to as the, quote, common benefit, protection, and security of the people. But why was this happening? Why had the republicanism of the founding generation failed them so? For the previous 13 years, the people of the United States had been governed by 13 separate entities. State governments under the Articles of Confederation were thought to be republican. The founders had thrown off rule by an aristocratic few in favor of rule by the democratic many. If under aristocracy, the many are screwed by the few, and this is actually a technical legal term, just so you know, it's not. This is actually harkens back to when I was a Cook County prosecutor. If, if under aristocracy, the many are screwed by the few, the democratic or republican alternative was premised on the belief that the people won't screw themselves. But it turns out this theory that the people won't screw themselves had unexpectedly proven to be false in practice. State legislatures began enacting debtor relief laws that both undermined the rights of creditors and impaired economic prosperity, which requires a credit economy that can safely rely on the obligation of private contracts to collect from debtors. States also erected a debilitating assortment of trade barriers to protect their own businesses from competing firms in neighboring states. The result of these and other policies was a nationwide economic downturn, a big, what we would call today, depression. So Republican government, as it was then conceived, was clearly not working for the common benefit, protection, and security of the people, or so many believed, but again, why not? To answer this question, in August, uh, in April of 1787, largely for his own benefit, Madison composed an essay with the title, The Vices of the Political System of the United States. In Vices, Madison identified the source of the problem in what he called, the, the problem was the injustice of, he called the injustice of the laws of the states. He referred to the injustice of the laws of the states. And the causes of what he referred to as this evil, he contended, could be retraced to the representative bodies in the states and ultimately, he said, to the people themselves. This, he wrote, quote, called into question the fundamental principle of Republican government, that the majority who rule in such governments are the safest guardians of both the public good and of private rights. Madison, he didn't put it quite as crudely as I previously did. He was a lot more uh, elevated than that. Madison concluded that we must be far more realistic about rule by popular majorities. All civil, civilized societies, he explains, quote, are divided into different interests and factions, as they happen to be creditor, creditors or debtors, rich or poor, husbandmen, merchants or manufacturers, members of different religious sects, followers of different political leaders, inhabitants of different districts, owners of different kinds of property, etc. In a democracy, the debtors outnumber the creditors, and the poor outnumber the rich. The larger group can simply outvote the smaller. The, quote, majority, however composed, he wrote, ultimately give the law. Whenever, therefore, an apparent interest or common passion unites a majority, what is to restrain them from unjust violations of the rights and interests of the minority or of individuals, he added. To illustrate the problem, Madison posed the following thought experiment. Place three individuals in a situation wherein the interest of each depends on the voice of the others and then give to two of them an interest opposed to that of the third. Will the latter be secure, he asked. He said the prudence of every man would shun the danger, 
Likewise, quote, will 2,000 in a like situation be less likely to encroach on the rights of 1,000? In short, under the democratic vision of republicanism, there is nothing stopping a majority from, of the polity from engaging in self-dealing at the expense of the minority. Madison concluded that what was needed was nothing less than a new Republican form of government that would address the weakness of democratic state governments while still preserving popular sovereignty. As Madison put it, quote, to secure the public good and private rights against the danger of such a faction and at the same time to preserve the spirit and form of popular government is then the great object to which our inquiries are directed. Now remember, he wrote all of this before the Constitutional Convention. This was kind of a paper he wrote for himself to prep himself to go to Philadelphia and be in the convention. Now Madison was not alone in locating the ills facing the nation in the majoritarian democracy of the states. At the Philadelphia Convention, Edmund Randolph, the first Attorney General of the United States, observed that, quote, the general object was to provide a cure for the evils under which the U.S. labored, and that, quote, in tracing these evils to their origin, every man had found it in the turbulence and follies of democracy. Eldridge Gerry, or Gary, from Massachusetts stated, quote, the evils we experience flow from the excess of democracy. Roger Sherman of Connecticut contended that the people, quote, immediately should have as little to do as may be about the government. Governor Morris from Pennsylvania noted that, quote, every man of observation has seen in the democratic branches of the state legislatures precipitation, in Congress changeableness, and in every department excesses against personal liberty and private property and personal safety. Even those who remained more amenable to democracy, like George Mason of Virginia, said that, quote, we had been too democratic in forming state governments. At the conclusion of the convention, anxious citizens gathered outside Independence Hall to learn what had been produced behind closed doors. They had deliberated in secret. It is said, perhaps apocryphally, that, Benjamin, when Benjamin, that ben, as Benjamin Franklin left the building, a woman in the crowd asked him, well, doctor, what have we got? A Republican, a republic, or a monarchy? And Franklin is said to have responded, a republic, if you can keep it. But while the new form of government devised in Philadelphia was not a monarchy, neither was it democratic. Yet Franklin still called it a republic. And that was because the meaning of that term had just been changed by the men in the building from which Franklin was leaving. A Republican Constitution was no longer a Democratic one. It was in the states, but now it wasn't. And soon, every state would replace their more Democratic constitutions with a variant on the new Republican form of government designed to check majority rule. Now, what does this story teach us about the difference between a Democratic Constitution and a Republican one? I propose that the fundamental difference between a democracy and a republic is the conception of legitimacy that underlies it. A democracy is premised on the legitimacy of rule by the people as a group, or collective popular sovereignty, which in practice means rule by a majority of the people. Under this conception of legitimacy, anything that thwarts what's called the will of the majority is said to be illegitimate. For example, if we select presidents by electoral votes allocated to states on a winner-take-all basis, it is possible for a president who gains a majority of electors, uh, to, for a president who gains a majority of electors who receive less than a majority and receive less than a majority of the popular vote. We all know about this. Now because it is claimed that that would thwart the will of the majority, we are told that the Electoral College is undemocratic, that's what they say, and therefore illegitimate, which is also what they say. Adopting, for example, a national popular vote for president is said to be good. Why? Because it is more democratic. The same legitimacy objection is raised against the Senate of the United States, in which every state receives two senators, regardless of its population. Because the will of the majority of the country can be thwarted by senators from states with less than a majority of the population of the country, 
The Senate is criticized for what? For being undemocratic. Replacing the Senate with one that is proportionate to population or abolishing the Senate altogether is said to be good. Why? Because it is more democratic. Then there is the judiciary. Judges are not elected by the people and federal judges hold their offices for life. It is often said that they are not representative or accountable to the people. So whenever a court holds a law enacted by a majority of a legislature unconstitutional, this can be criticized as what? Undemocratic and therefore what? Illegitimate. Imposing term limits to give elected presidents more opportunities to appoint justices reflecting the will of the majority or expanding the number of justices to allow a politically elected president to appoint more justices, that's court packing is said to be good because it would make the court more democratic. <clears throat> is it possible to get a water? Thanks. In his speech to the House of Representatives, proposing the addition of a Bill of Rights to the Constitution, and I just said as an aside here, there's a good argument to say that Madison was not the father of the Constitution. There were a lot of fathers of the Constitution in Philadelphia who were as influential as Madison was. But it is fair to call him the father of the Bill of Rights because there wouldn't have been the first 10 amendments if it hadn't been for him taking the initiative as a congressman from Orange County, Virginia. Uh, he pushed the, the House to take this matter up when they did not want to take the matter up. So he deserves credit for that. And in a speech in which he proposed the addition of these amendments that we now call the Bill of Rights, Madison observed that in a Republican government like that of the United States, quote, the prescriptions in favor of liberty ought to be leveled against that quarter where the, greater danger, the greatest danger lies, namely that which possesses the highest prerogative of power. But this is not found in either the executive or the legislative departments of government, but in the body of the people operating by a majority against the minority. So he's saying that's why we need amendments, that's why we need a Bill of Rights, actually to counteract the majority of the people is why we need it. In other words, for the founders, because majorities can be expected to deny or disparage the rights of the minority of the people, majority rule was not the answer to the problem of who should govern. It was the problem to be solved by a new Republican form of government in which all the people, whether in the majority or in the minority, were the ultimate sovereigns. And any solutions to this problem will necessarily be undemocratic in the sense that they will be designed to thwart the will of the majority. Now, I think the founders were right about this. And so do most people when they're in the political minority. Therefore, when someone proposes to abolish the Electoral College or abolish the Senate or end lifetime tenure for judges or expand the Supreme Court to make room for justices who will rule their way, it is not enough for them to say that these changes make the Constitution more democratic. The tyranny of the majority is the problem for which our Republican Constitution is the answer. There must be other and different grounds for adopting these so-called reforms, and such grounds are rarely articulated. Now with this in mind, how then should we think about the difference between a democracy and a republic? Now some complicate this question by distinguishing between direct democracy, like town halls or referenda where everybody votes, and representative democracies uh, in which you elect representatives who then deliberate in a legislative body. They refer to a republic as a representative democracy. And there are many dictionaries that agree with that definition. If you go look it up, most dictionaries are gonna say a, a republic is a representative democracy. But that's to miss the problem for which our Republican Constitution was the solution. Remember, that the state governments to which the founders objected as too democratic, they were all representative democracies. That's what they were, and that's what they were responding to. They were, they were, they were not direct democracies. Everybody in the state didn't vote. They were, had representatives. So if that's what a republic was, the founders didn't like it. So that definition you see in the dictionary doesn't apply to what they created. Remember, they criticized those, Republican, those representative democracies as too democratic. Now, others claim today that the term democracy includes checks to protect the rights of individuals and groups. But when the Electoral College and the Senate are criticized for being undemocratic, it is solely 
because these institutions are said to violate the principle of majoritarian rule. That's why they're wrong. That's why they're illegitimate. That they might serve as checks on the power of a bare majority to run roughshod over a minority is dismissed as irrelevant. I think the difference between the Democratic and Republican conceptions of legitimacy turns on two different conceptions of what we call popular sovereignty. And that, in turn, is based on two different conceptions of we the people. Those holding a democratic conception of legitimate rule view we the people as a group or a collective. And the purpose of a constitution is to empower the majority of we the people to rule. Applying this conception of legitimacy, the Electoral College, the Senate, and unelected judges are all problematic insofar as they thwart the will of the majority the will of the people as reflected in their legislatures. It is said that in a democracy, a constitution should be designed so the will of the majority should generally prevail. That is why small d Democrats tend to favor parliamentary systems over, or rule by popular initiatives over our system of checks and balances. In contrast, those holding a Republican conception of legitimacy view we the people as individuals, not we the people as a group, but we the people as individuals. As the Declaration of Independence affirmed, we the people are endowed with certain inalienable rights, among which are the individual rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Each of those rights are individual rights. Then the next sentence of the Declaration states the American theory of government, and it says, quote, to secure these rights, Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. To, conser to, to preserve which rights? The rights in the previous sentence. Those were the individual rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is the American theory of government. Government exists to secure the pre-existing individual rights of we the people, each and every one of us. Now, some, of will, some will respond that if the only alternative to majority rule is rule by a minority, Majority rule is clearly preferable to minority rule. And this raises an important point. The threats to the rights retained by the people can come from both a majority or a powerful and influential minority who manage to take power. As Madison famously explained in Federalist 10, quote, by a faction, I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or a minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. So he thinks the problem can be minority factions, not just majority factions. So to protect the rights of we the people, each and every one, we need a structure of government that protects against abuses of power by both the majority and by influential minorities. Now, how this is best done is not easy to demonstrate. But my analysis to this point rules out one position that we hear all the time. Quote, I'm just quoting some anonymous person, hypothetical person. We should oppose and change any structural constraints on power that thwart the will of the majority because these constraints are undemocratic. That objection we need to rule out as an objection. This objection takes us absolutely nowhere in addressing the serious problem of how the rights of everyone are to be protected from abuses of power by the majority or a minority. In short, if someone claims we should make our institutions more democratic, the first question we should ask is, well, what do you mean by democratic? And if the answer has something to do with the will of the majority or majority rule, we should then ask, well, how exactly will making a constitution more democratic make things better? That's what we should be concerned about, making things better. How exactly will you ensure, the person who is making this claim, that the more empowered majority will respect the rights of the minority? And won't anything you propose to protect minorities, anything you propose to protect minorities, won't that be inherently undemocratic too? In light of the problem of minority or, major and major or majority faction, how should we think about constitutional structure? What is needed is the protection of the rights of each and every person, who John Jay, uh, our first Chief Justice, referred to as fellow citizens and joint sovereigns. That's what we are. We're fellow citizens 
and we're joint sovereigns, all of us. Whether that person can be said to be part of a majority or a minority shouldn't matter. What matters is each one of us, as fellow citizens and joint sovereigns, have rights that deserve protection. And this is where courts, especially courts protected by lifetime tenure, become crucial. Courts are where the rubber meets the road. The due process of law guaranteed by the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments, which bind both the federal and, and government and the states, are all about the guarantee of a judicial process before any individual person may be deprived of his life or her liberty by capital punishment, I'm sorry, his life or liberty by capital punishment, strike that, I'm just saying it wrong, his or her life by capital punishment, liberty by imprisonment or property by a fine or civil judgment. So if we think of life, liberty, or property in the Due Process Clause, you can think of the two bad things that happen to you if you're accused of something. One is you could be put to death, that's your life. The second is you could be put in jail, that's your liberty. And the third thing is you could be fined or have a civil judgment against you, that's your property. Before those things can happen to you, you deserve the due process of law. Each individual person is entitled to a due process of law before those things can happen to that person. Today, this is called uh, procedural due process. Second, under the due process of law, the due process of law, let's remember, the phrase is not due process, it's due process of law. Under the due process of law requires a judicial process in which independent judges assess whether a person is being deprived of his or her life, liberty, or property by a valid law. That is, by a law that was in what the Declaration calls the just powers of the legislature to enact. Just because the legislature enacts it, something doesn't necessarily make it a valid law. At the federal level, this means holding Congress to its enumerated powers, the ones that are listed in the Constitution. So a Commerce Clause challenge, let's say, is also a due process of law challenge because the judges are going to hold Congress to within its commerce power. And at the state level, it means holding state legislatures to a proper conception of what's called its police powers. Now, police powers aren't written in the Constitution, but it is the theory under which state legislatures enact most of what they do. What some today call judicial engagement is simply the call for judges to do their job, which is to independently assess whether the legislature has acted within the proper scope of its legislative powers and to be realistic when doing so. A rule of complete deference in which legislatures always win, like the modern rational basis test, when you go to law school you'll learn about that, is an abdication of the due process of law. Now the fact that I just relied upon the text of the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments to make this argument suggests another important feature of a Republican Constitution. To ensure that government is kept within its just powers, the Constitution should be put in writing. I was just mentioning at dinner that I just got kind of a bucket list invitation to lecture at the Oxford Union next month on the proposition, should Britain adopt a written constitution? And they've asked me to present the affirmative for that should be, they should put their constitution in writing. So let me talk a little bit about the advantages of having your constitution be in writing. Let's start with first principles. The constitution is not the law that governs us. Here's a copy of the constitution. I'm going to bring you news. This is not the law that governs us, with one exception, but I don't care about the exceptions now. There's one exception where it does. This is not the law that governs What is this? This is the law that governs those who govern us. This is the law that governs those who govern us. In a republic, the people or citizenry are the ultimate sovereign, and the governments that are instituted among men are merely their servants, the servants of the people, their agents. But the only way that we, the people, as a whole, can possibly govern their agents and government is by a document like the Constitution. How else are we going to do it? How else are we going to impose law on them? Without it, the servants of the people become their effective masters. Of the, they become the masters of the people. And sovereign citizens, which is what we are, we're citizens, we become mere subjects. Now, I'm going to have to watch myself when I go to England and talk about being a subject because they think of themselves as subjects and they're happy about that. So that's not going to be a good debate trick when I go there. But here, we think of ourselves as citizens, and if I say it reduces us to mere subjects, that means something over here. But wait, there's more. Unlike we the people who are never asked for our consent to be governed, each and every person who receives power under our written constitution, 
only receives this power after taking an express oath to be bound by its terms. No government agent, no government official gets to take power under this Constitution without taking an expressed oath to preserve and protect and defend and obey this Constitution. So there is 100% consent by the legislators, the president, and the federal judges, along with the officers of state governments, to be bound by what the Constitution says. But if that oath, um, that oath would be literally meaningless. In fact, would, by this I mean it would have no meaning. If it was an oath to obey whatever the government official thought the Constitution ought to say, rather than what it actually meant when it was enacted. So if I'm taking an oath to obey this Constitution and then I say, yeah, but it's whatever I say it is, then that's an oath to nothing. That's not really an oath. That's like taking an oath with my fingers crossed behind my back. The oath, the Constitution must mean something other than what I think it means or I'm not taking an oath to anything. For these reasons, those who take an oath to be governed by this law can no more change the law that governs them without going through the amendment procedures that are in the Constitution, then we, the people, can change the laws they make to govern us without going through the legislative process. So by this route, we arrive at the following conclusion. The meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. The meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. And this happens to be a one-sentence summary of the philosophy known as originalism. Now, many of you might have heard about originalism because there's been a lot of debate about it since we've had judicial nominee nominees to the Supreme Court who say they are originalists. But I've just given you a one-sentence definition of what originalism is. It's the view that whatever meaning this Constitution has, it should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. Now let me conclude by summarizing why it matters that our Constitution is Republican and not Democratic. First, a Republican Constitution with its undemocratic checks and balances on democratic majoritarian rule is needed to protect the individual rights of we the people, each and every one. Whether any particular structural feature like an independent judiciary and federalism is an effective protection of the rights retained by the people requires a separate analysis. The democratic will of the majority is not the solution to the problem of constitutional legitimacy, but instead the majoritarianism of democracy is the very problem a Republican form of government is needed to solve. So the second takeaway of this talk is that merely claiming that a structural check on government power is undemocratic tells us next to nothing. It actually tells us nothing about its merit. When someone makes this objection, the next question should be, okay, apart from the fact that it is anti-majoritarian, now tell me what else is wrong with it. Third, to withstand the political pressures by majority and influential minority factions, the Constitution was put in writing to provide the law that governs those who govern us. And those who are to be governed by this law can no more change it without going through the amendment process uh, than we can change the laws they impose on us without going through the legislative process. So fourth and finally, the meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment, which is a one-sentence summary of originalism. Why then does it matter that we live in a democracy or republic? Because only a truly republican form of government is designed to protect the liberty and sovereignty of we the people, not a majority of the people, not a privileged minority of the people, but we the people, each and every one of us. Thank you. It turns out I didn't need it like I thought I was about to need it, but I will take a sip now. So I am happy to open this up to your, I'm mic'd up here, I don't have to stand there anymore, um, and to talk about anything, any questions about my talk, we can start there and then we can move on to other stuff. Yes? Well, we, in order to answer that excellent question, um, we would have to, um, I'd have to know a little bit more about specifics. So 
some of the Constitution is written very specifically. Um, and there's no real dispute about what it says. And so, for example, it says that every, senate, every state should have two senators. And it doesn't matter how big California gets and how small Wyoming gets, they all get two senators. That's not, so there has been changing circumstances. In fact, the, well, there has been changing circumstances, but if the way to, proper way to change that is to change the Constitution. It turns out the smaller states aren't going to let that happen under our amendment process. Uh, but that's the reason why the structure is the way it is, to protect the smaller states who represent the minority. There are other provisions of the Constitution that are mit written in more general terms, and they can be applied in the future um, to the facts as the facts may change. So it is not a, it does not, the meaning of the Constitution doesn't have to evolve uh, in order to be applied in future circumstances to future facts. So for example, the right to keep and bear arms applies to weapons, um, and which weapons exactly it applies to is going to change over time depending on what weapons exist, um, as will um, the regulation of liberty, which is something that I don't talk about in this, in this talk, but my view is, and the historical view is, that all liberty may be reasonably regulated uh, in order to protect the health and safety of the public. And so saying that something is a constitutional right doesn't mean that it cannot be regulated in any way. It simply means that it, the burden is placed on the government to justify its regulations as necessary and proper to carrying out some prop and that is within the competency of a legislature to pursue. So, um, within that framework, regulations and the law that regulates liberty can evolve over time e within the fixed meaning of the Constitution. But there's more to be said about this. Given It would depend on the examples out of the Constitution to say whether this is um, a more general phrase um, or a more particular phrase. There's a lot of phrases that law professors claim to be very general and therefore leave open a lot of room for uh, disagreement or dispute, which are actually, if you do the work, much more specific than they claim them to be. And therefore, they're more, a little bit more like two senators per state and a little less uh, open-ended than law professors would like to think they are. Yes? Who, who had that? Linda Colley. Uh, they had something about a written constitution in Great Britain. I have to read this because I have to prep. As soon as I'm done with this, I have to start prepping for that. And um, it was hard for me to figure out what her ultimate argument was, whether she thought it was a good idea or she just said it would be time to change. And there was this discussion in Great Britain about whether I haven't, I mean, as I say, as soon as I get done with this, I'll have to start prepping for that. But it's kind of like one thing at a time. Uh, also teach my classes. So I haven't, I haven't gotten up to speed on that yet. But I can tell you, I can preview some of the arguments I'm going to make when I'm there. Because I'll be debating against somebody who was the former Solicitor General of the United Kingdom and a member of Parliament who's an excellent debater. And uh, we each get 20 minutes. And I'm going to say some things like, um, well, let's take the Magna Carta. You think it was a good thing that the Magna Carta was put in writing? Maybe, I think so. How about the English Bill of Rights, the English Declaration of Rights? I mean, why did they put that in writing, I suppose? Was it, would it be better if it wasn't in writing? Um, how about any, um, you know, contract, major contracts we entered, buy a house? How about renting a car? Those things all get put in writing. You get, those transactions get put in writing, but the whole government apparatus that's supposed to govern us doesn't get put in writing? And when I argue, when I'm going to argue there for a written constitution, I'm not going to argue for the American Constitution. You know, paraphrasing President Obama when it came to health care, if they like their constitution, they can keep their constitution. They can just, just put it in writing if they like it. Um, and there's a virtue of that, and that is it protects that constitution you like from being changed in ways you don't like without having to go through some amendment process. And they could make their amendment process much easier than ours is. And it could still be in writing. But at least you'd know what the law was that governs those who govern us, and ultimately I'm going to get to the issue of popular sovereignty and who is the boss and it's really supposed to ultimately be the people, even in Great Britain, even with a monarch, even with a constitutional monarch. The constitutional monarch serves at the pleasure of the people. Yes? I'm, I'm curious what you make. 
Well, how does, it, how does that counteract what I was saying? Because well, remember I said that if you just, if, if your only objection to something, and by the way, I may have my own problems with Citizens United, I'm not getting there, but if your only objection to something is it empowers the minority, now my next question is, okay, what's wrong with that? Because the whole point of a Republican Constitution is to empower minorities against the majority, and to some extent majorities against the minority as well. I mean, it, but there, it's, it's, the mere fact that it empowers a minority is not an objection unless I hear more about why. Um, so if it's empowering a minority, let's just say in free speech generally, let's not focus on corporations now. Free speech generally is going to empower the minority of people who want to say things that are unpopular to the majority. You don't need a First Amendment to protect the majority because they're in the majority. So they're going to say what they want. You need a First Amendment to protect the minority who are going to utter sentiments that are going to be contrary to the majority. So um, Citizens United and the role the corporations play in all of this is a somewhat different and subject about which I think we could have an interesting conversation, but maybe not tonight. Um, I will say that with respect to that particular corporation, that was formed as an expressive association. They were, they were, they, that, that was incorporated as a nonprofit in order to express the opinions of the people who got together and incorporated it. That's not true of all corporations. I mean, some corporations are actually incorporated to like make cars or, you know, deodorant or something. That's what they're, but Citizens United was actually organized as a speech institution to promote the speech of the people who organized it. So no matter what you think about the rights of corporations generally, to have freedom of speech. You might think that when citizens gather together and assume the corporate form, which basically just creates limited liability uh, if they get sued by somebody, that's what a corporation does. It, it's, if, if you get sued, you, only the assets of the corporation can be reached. You can't reach the personal wealth of the owners. That's what but limited. Can't vote, right? so no, but the people who make up the corporation can vote. Um, and the people who make, and the corporations can own property that can be taken away by people who vote. And so that is, by the way, an argument why corporations might need a, some speech protections because how are they, they have to protect them. We say that corporations um, can protect themselves in the political process from having their property taken away. Well, how do they, exactly do they protect themselves in the political process if they're not allowed to speak in the political process? Uh, but as I say in the first place, this is a more complicated question uh, because corporations are a legal entity that are created by government uh, they have some privileges. Whether those privileges argue against some behavior on their part is really a separate question than the easier question of each and every one of us as individual persons, which is why you asked me that question, because you wanted to complicate it. So good, good on you. Yes? Do you think the two-party system helps or hinders uh, this idea of like healthy and popular? <sighs> that's, a, that's a hard question. I, I, I mean, it, when people say that's a great question, what they really mean is that's a really hard question. Um, so it's both a great and a hard question. Let me say well, this about the two-party system. The founders did not anticipate it. So if you talk about going back to things they didn't expect, one of the things they didn't expect is the two-party system. They had set up this whole government of checks and balances on the assumption that there, that there weren't going to be parties. They didn't think of par parties. Um, in fact, the Electoral College was going to pick the president um, from amongst the most qualified people that could be picked. The, s senator, the Senate were being picked by state legislators who would know the people they picked. That was our system up until 1917, 1914, whenever the, that, the 17th Amendment got enacted. Um, it was only the House that was going to be elected, and then it was going to be elected by people locally, so they would know who it was. Um, so they didn't have, a, and the other thing is that they, they assumed that there would be this institutional rivalry between the legislature and the executive, and the executive and the courts, and the courts and the legislature, there'd be these institutional rivalries. They didn't count on the fact that political parties were going to arise that could overcome some of these checks and balances. And the irony of ironies is who started forming the political parties? It was Alexander Hamilton on the one hand, and James Madison on the other hand. And they started doing it like right away. Now they didn't have, these modern, these parties they founded, were not exactly like our modern parties. They were more like, if you said I was a Federalist or if you said I was a Republican, because the, the, Mad the Jeffersonians were called Republicans and the, and the Hamiltonians were called Federalists. This is more like what we call conservative and liberal or progressive. They're more like political labels than formal parties. It wasn't until the Democratic Party got formed 
um, uh, to, in support of the candidacy of Andrew Jackson that we got something like a modern political party uh, known as the Democratic Party. Also, they called themselves the democracy, interestingly enough. And they were called the democracy. And because their theory was that they represented the people, their party, their whole party represented the people, and the other party, which were the Whigs, um, they actually just represented the aristocracy. So you had one party that supposedly spoke for the people against another party that really spoke for a privileged minority, is the theory that the, Demo the, De the, the Demo Democrats had. That's not really the two-party system we currently envision. But again, this was an unforeseen circumstance, and the problem that parties have created is that they cannot override some of the checks and balances. So when you have a president picking judges, and they have to be approved by a Senate, if that Senate is in the sands of the opposition party, those judges are going to have a harder time. It's going to inhibit who the president can pick and get through. If, it's, if the Senate's in the hands of the president's party, they are going to basically give the green light to whoever the president picks. So a lot's going to depend on who control, which party controls what. Um, so I, uh, the one thing I will just say is we have a two-party system. Um, and in a two-party system, I think third parties have a tendency not to get anywhere and to actually stand in the way of, um, you know, better outcomes. Uh, so I tend to be opposed to third parties in a two-party system because they tend to take votes away from the party they're closest to, and that seems to be counterproductive. Um, and so for that reason, we have to live with the two-party system we have unless it's started to be changed, and, you know, it could be. Again, it's not in the Constitution that we have two parties. This is not mandated by the Constitution. It just affects how the Constitution works. Yes? I couldn't, because of the acoustics in here, I just couldn't understand what you said. Can you just... Oh, other than the one we have? Okay, well, let me tell you one of the ones we have, and then I'll give you a possible reform. Um, what we, ha we, have, uh, we have new checks on state power we didn't have at the founding. Uh, so, for example, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments operate as checks on state power. In fact, the Constitution that I defend, the Constitution, if I defend the Constitution or enforce the original meaning of the Constitution, I don't defend the original Constitution because that's not the Constitution we have today. We have an amended constitution. It's been amended 27 times in sometimes very significant ways. And in the wake of the Civil War, um, uh, in the wake of slavery, um, the 13th Amendment gets enacted, limiting the powers of states. Prior to that, states had so much power that they could authorize the ownership of some people by other people. That's how much power states had, free of federal constraint. That's a lot of power. But after the 13th Amendment, they didn't have that power anymore. The 14th Amendment, which further restricts states, was, an argue, was enacted not to abolish slavery, but to oppose white supremacy that arose in the country in the aftermath of abolishing slavery, because the people who were the slaveholders, uh, they weren't content with having lost a war. They tried to reimpose, reimpose slavery by other means short of slavery, and then the Republicans, who would control Congress, had to pass, first of all, they passed a number of civil rights laws, which were very important, and then they had to pass the 14th Amendment, to authorize them passing even more civil rights laws. The first sentence of the, the second sentence of the 14th Amendment says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. That's a serious check on state power, except for the fact that the Supreme Court gutted that clause five years after it was enacted, and it has only been used one time since. I hate to bring the bad news to you. But following the original meaning of the Constitution means following that clause, even though the Supreme Court has essentially plucked it out of the Constitution and it doesn't exist. So the point I'm trying to make here is we added additional constraints on state power that if enforced, which they aren't always enforced, would actually be a good thing and protect the rights of the people from being violated by their own state government, something they could do before the Civil War and they can't do now if the, con if the whole Constitution if the original meaning of all the Constitution was enacted. My most recent book is called The Original Meaning of the 14th Amendment. If you're interested in what I'm talking about, you might take a look at that book.
But what more could we do? What we don't have is very effective checks on federal power. We now have, in, on paper at least, checks against state power, but we don't have effective checks on federal power. So I proposed at one time a constitutional amendment which I have to say was kind of thrilling, that was, was introduced into both houses of Congress. So I actually wrote a constitutional amendment. I got the satisfaction of seeing a resolution on behalf of that amendment introduced into both houses of Congress. It was called the Repeal Amendment. And what it would have done is it would have given a supermajority of states, legislatures, the power to repeal any federal law or regulation. If two-thirds of the legislat state legislatures got together and passed a resolution, each of them passed a resolution to abolish a particular law or, or federal law or regulation, it would then be repealed. Now, Congress could then reenact it. It doesn't bar them from reenacting it again. But at that point, a supermajority of the states would have been on record saying, we don't care for this, and I think reenacting it might be more difficult, especially since many things get enacted by Congress in huge omnibus bills that are not you know, individually analyzed and individual things could be objected to when a big bill gets passed and the repeal amendment would give a state check on federal power, but it didn't get adopted. So it's not in the Constitution. So that would be an additional check that I would favor for, I would be looking for additional ways that state governments can check the federal government. At the same time, I want to, um, I want to revive all the additional, all the checks that the federal government has on states, some of which have been neglected ever since they were adopted. You, I know, I heard you talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, so this is a great invitation to say something that probably should be in my talk. It was in a longer version of the talk, but not in the version I gave you. Uh, and that is that um, elections are very important. Elections are very important. The fact that I said um, um, that I'm not a small D Democrat, I'm a small R Republican, because I favor a constitution that puts constraints on a majority will, doesn't mean majority will is of, is of no value. It just means it needs to be constrained and held within its proper conception of its powers. Not that it shouldn't get its way if it is within a proper conception of its powers. And if nothing else, maj uh, majoritarian elections are extremely important for changing who holds power. You don't want a society in which you can't vote out your rulers. Because if you have a society in which you can't vote out your rulers, you're gonna there's only two ways to get out from under them, revolution or assassination. And you don't want to live in a society where that's the only way you can change your rulers. So democratic elections are extremely important um, to constraining the government. In fact, democratic elections are one of many constraints on government power that secures the rights of the people, in particular, in this point, the rights of the majority. Because remember, I said the minority can infringe on the rights of the majority. Madison said that. So you need to have a majoritarian or democratic component to government in order to protect the rights of the majority from an abusive minority. So there is a very important role for this way of, of manifesting what you're calling the democratic spirit, but it just needs to be channeled. And my only objection is that that is not the end of the matter. Saying something is democratic is not the end of the matter because the, the majority Real of the demo of uh, if what you mean by democratic is majority rule, a majority can abuse the rights of the minority. We all know that, and so that has to be checked. A republican form of government is there to check the will of the majority, not to eliminate it, not to supersede it with the will of an individual person or rule by judges or anything like that. I'm against all that. So I think elections are extremely important. 
um, democratic elections are very, very important. They're just not the end all or be all of constitutional legitimacy. And so I'll just return to the lesson I hope you take away from this, and that is simply by saying a feature of our Constitution is undemocratic does not tell you whether it's actually bad. It might be bad, but now you have to make the additional argument as to why it's bad. And just saying it's undemocratic doesn't get us anywhere because we don't have a democratic constitution in my terms. We have a Republican constitution um, and we should be glad we do because that's what's necessary to protect the rights of each and every one of us if it's followed. I just want that one last caveat. If it's followed, if it's not followed, it can't protect us. And I'm afraid, and this is that, as I already spoke about the Privileges or Immunities Clause, which sounds very important, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, it's not followed. And if it's not followed, it can't protect us. So what I favor is following the whole Constitution, including the parts that nowadays get ignored or overlooked. And with that, I want to renew my thanks for being invited here to this beautiful campus uh, at The Ohio University.